Hello everyone and welcome to the Living New Deal webinar series. My name is Bridget Boyle and I am your technical support today. Just wanted to jump in here and welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us on this lovely Friday evening. If you have questions or comments, um, well comments can be in the chat, but any questions that we ha you have, I would invite you to use the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That helps us track your questions and make sure that we can answer as many possible, as many as possible. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I will now invite Susan Ives to come on and introduce the webinar. Happy Earth Day, everybody. And welcome to the Living New Deals webinar series, The Art of the New Deal. I'm Susan Ives, Director of Communications for the Living New Deal a nonprofit organization in Berkeley, California. We work to preserve the New Deal's legacy, make people aware of what the New Deal was and did, and promote the New Deal as a model for good government today. The Living New Deal website, livingnewdeal.org, is a primary source of information about FDR's New Deal and those who are part of it. You'll also find a searchable online map showing what the New Deal built nationwide. It includes some 17,000 New Deal sites throughout the country, and it's still growing. If you haven't signed up already, please sign up to receive our newsletter and invitations to special events and ongoing online programs like this one. This webinar series explores the many and diverse cultural arts programs the New Deal made possible and what a new New Deal for the arts could do today. We hope you will join us on May 19th for a presentation about the New Deal photographer, Arthur Ross Stein, presented by his daughter, Dr. Annie Ross Stein Sagan, founder of the Ross Stein Legacy Project. Our guest tonight is Dr. Stephanie Johnson. Dr. Johnson teaches in the Visual and Public Art Department at California State University, Monterey Bay, and serves as a board member for Theater First in Berkeley. She holds a doctorate in interdisciplinary studies with a focus on public policy. Her current research is on the Harlem Renaissance and the New Deal. The great migration of African-Americans from the rural South to the urban North to escape, escape Jim Crow and build a better life was instrumental to the Harlem Renaissance. It was based in Harlem, but it was in fact a nationwide movement and a turning point in black cultural history. It encompassed African-American music, dance, art, fashion, literature, theater, and politics. The New Deal's Federal Art Project, Federal Theater Project, and Federal Music Project included black artists but the artists themselves had to demand opportunities to work for the WPA programs and for fair wages once hired. They also nurtured and inspired young black artists that would follow. Harvey Smith, project advisor to the Living New Deal and board member of the National New Deal Preservation Association will interview Stephanie following her presentation. And you can join in the conversation by writing your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Your donations make the Living New Deal's work and programs like this available to everyone free of charge. We welcome your support. And now we are delighted to welcome Dr. Stephanie Ann Johnson. Thank you. Let me unmute. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I began this research nine years ago when I was in a doctoral program. And there's so much more to know and to learn. Um, this has given me an opportunity to refresh my scholarship and to find out things that I did not find out uh, nine years ago in my initial quest. So I'm gonna start to share my screen now. May technology be with us. Is that display correct, Bridget? Yes, it looks great, thank you. 
<clears throat> so this will be a very brief introduction to the complexities, challenges, and benefits of the relationship between the Harlem Renaissance and the New Deal from the point of view of those who were affected. There are several important movements that bookend the Harlem Renaissance. Professor Lewis, Henry Louis Gates has noted that there are three Negro Renaissances, which are periods of time when unprecedented levels of artistic output emerged from within the black community in the United States. <clears throat> These movements share in common the power and effectiveness of black self-identification, group agency, and collaboration. I mean, since he has made that thesis, we can also talk about there being a new postmodern renaissance, a fourth one. So this is a photograph of <clears throat> Georgette Seabrook. Her life and work spanned the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts movements. As an artist, she provided education and gave voice to the most marginalized members of the community in which she lived throughout her life. The first Negro Renaissance was a literary one. Going against the laws forbidding Black people to read, let alone write, Black women of the 19th century published poems, short stories, novels, and autobiographies. <clears throat> These books were distributed among the Black community and used for education, creative expression, and inspiration. Modern scholars have retrieved, reprinted, and archived these important writings. The Black Arts Movement. Like the Harlem Renaissance that came before it, the Black Arts Movement was multidisciplinary. As Susan said, included music, dance, theater, visual art, fashion, um, literature, and it continued the tradition of Black agency, self-definition, and the embracing of African identity and traditions in this country. Positioned between the literary and Black arts movements, the Harlem Renaissance has been characterized as one of the most important art movements in the history of the United States. <clears throat> Though relatively short, 1919 to 1931, there were enormous creative activities that sprung from the Black community. These are two photographs by James Van Der Zee a Harlem-based photographer who documented Black life during the Harlem Renaissance and beyond. This Harlem Renaissance was fueled by the Great Migration. Having a little bit of a technical glitch, give me a second. Okay, is that, uh, is that yeah, correct? that's right, that looks good, yeah. All right. <clears throat> the Great Migration appearing during, a period during which Black people moved from the South to the North in search of freedom, economic opportunities, and safety. The Harlem Renaissance has provided inspiration worldwide to artists and scholars as an example of cultural pride and artistic innovation expressed through the arts. The most important aspect of the Harlem Renaissance is that it came from within the Black community for the benefit of the Black community. <clears throat> the Harlem Artists Guild. Romare Bearden stated, quote, the first meeting of the Guild was held during the mid 1930s. I was astonished to find nearly 50 artists present since I had no idea there were that many Black artists in the entire country. Charles Alston's application for becoming a WPA supervisor was denied. So this exclusion stimulated the formation of the Harlem Artists Guild who demanded that African-American artists be equitably compensated 
<clears throat> for their participation. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was formed by Augusta Savage and Arthur Schomburg, <clears throat> the book collector after whom the Schomburg Center for the Study of African American Culture in Harlem is named. This also set the stage for hiring <clears throat> African American artists to paint the murals at the Harlem Hospital. Members included Virtus Hayes, Charles Alston, Elba Lightfoot, Selma Burke, Georgette Seabrook, and Gwendolyn Powell. Initially ignorant of African American artists, WPA administrators refused to hire them until overwhelming evidence from the Harmon Files, universities, colleges, galleries, and leading white artists <clears throat> demonstrated their existence. Romary Bearden was a painter and a mixed media artist. He was also co-author of A History of African American Artists and the designer of the City of Berkeley logo, the city in which I live. This was one of the challenges of the New Deal project. There were ways in which it did not rise above the prevailing system of racism. <clears throat> the Harlem Hospital murals. This is an image of the front of the Harlem Hospital, which has reproductions of the murals, which were created in 1936, and it lights up at night. This is also a shout out to my fellow New Yorkers and my family on this call. It was the FAP that funded the Harlem Hospital murals. The artists included Charles Alston, Curtis Hayes, Elba Lightfoot, Georgette Seabrook, the youngest artist and the only woman, Morgan Smith, Louis Vaughn, Wilford Delaney, and Hale, Hale Woodruff. The Harlem Hospital Center murals were initially commissioned in 1936, and they were the first major United States government commission awarded to African-American artists. There was a controversy about this commission. Hospital officials were against the African-American focus and imagery presented, saying that they didn't want this hospital to be categorized as a Negro hospital. Here's a video with some information. This particular um, set of works captures a major moment in um, African-American and Harlem history. And what we wanted to do was to make sure everybody understood where we've come from. If we don't do this process, these murals will be destroyed. I think the history of the murals at Harlem Hospital are a part of this community as much as the Schomburg, as much as 125th Street, as much as the Apollo. Uh, they've been here since 1936. They were created in a, a controversy. They were done by African Americans at a time when the Harlem community was um, at its height, but there was tremendous resistance to having um, African American artists and African American subjects uh, in the hospital. And so it's a part of a larger um, social political struggle. And finally, they are the work of uh, some of the most significant uh, African American artists of that time and of the Harlem Renaissance period. Historically, the people of Harlem have been very clear about their need to hold us responsible for these murals, to make sure these murals are preserved, uh, to make sure that no harm comes to them, as has harm come to murals in this hospital in the past. We were dedicated and focused, number one, to make sure the community understood we would preserve the murals. We created a, a steering committee that has worked together over the years to first and foremost make sure the process was in place, to identify folks to come in, uh, work on the murals in place, remove the murals without harming them, restore them in a facility that was uh, designed for that store them there, and then restore them when the new facility was built and opened. That whole process 
has been uh, one that's been transparent to the community, has had community input, dramatic at times, but steady throughout. I was, of course, delighted that uh, in the process of planning the expansion of the facility, that they would include in it a clear commitment to preserve those murals and restore them because they were in need of restoration. It's a big project. It's a long-term project. Um, I think the results are going to be very, very satisfying. Columbia University had people here who had the skill set to be able to provide both video experience and the historical analysis of those works and to write that up and place that on a website that's linked to one of our important centers, the Institute for Research in African American Studies. And this is a piece of history, an important history, both culturally and um, socially, about the Harlem community told in a very amazing way. The key significance of Columbia being involved, uh, they have affiliations with many hospitals, but only one public hospital, and that's in Harlem. And while the hospital physically is changing, we want to recognize and, and really honor the past. The past is the base for what we've been able to achieve. By creating a website and making that kind of information available nationally and internationally. We're able to create a greater awareness of the significance of the murals and hopefully at some point in time when they are restored and reinstalled, invite the public to come and see the original, see the real thing. All right, Bridget, can I share again? Yeah, now you can share again. It's not sharing. Can you share for me or? No, I cannot, but let's see. Let me just make sure the settings are still good. Yeah, that should be good. Let's see if I reload. Are we good? Not yet. Um, hmm, my goodness. I see it on my screen. Okay, just give me one second. Sure. Thank you everyone for your patience with this exciting technical fun. Now can you try again, please? Okay. Not sharing. <clears throat> Comes up on my screen, but I'm not sharing with anybody. Okay, and do you see share screen on your Zoom? I do. And I click it and nothing's moving. sure what's happening la, la, la. <laughs> um uh because i don't have the the presentation on my computer so i can't share it for you um okay give us two minutes to figure this out yeah if, maybe if you leave real quick and come back that could reset things i've never experienced this before just... okay i'm gonna leave and come right back sure meantime i'm sure harvey and susan will entertain everybody i'll be right back Harvey, do you want to come on to this? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm on. Um, I'll just say a few things just to give a little background. Um, Harlem Hospital obviously is in the middle of Harlem, but just to set the scene a little bit, uh, Stephanie mentioned uh, Arturo Sch uh, Schwamberg and the Schwamberg Center, which is part of the New York Public Library. It's, uh, the full name is the Schwamberg Center for Research in Black Culture. And it's literally r r across the street from the hospital. Um, and it's, it's quite a place. It, it's part of the library. Uh, Arturo Schwamberg, who had a 
incredible collection of, of books uh, established the, the initial center and library. And then the New York uh, Public Library picked it up at, as a branch. Uh, so it, it's an incredible place. It, it has artwork of its own um, and, and it's quite a place. So, you know, if you're in New York, um, obviously going to the hospital, even just outside to see that glass panel, which is a reproduction of the uh, um, one of the murals is, is amazing. And then the Schwamberg Center itself, which um, has museum space, um, and um, it is usually, you know, there are great things to see uh, at the Schwamberg Center. Yeah, and, uh, and Harvey, I think someone, you someone put on, up please? on the chat. There's a um, uh, a link to uh, the Schwamberg Center in the life of Arturo Schwamberg. I guess I, I could also add just uh, give a little background. Um, the the it, as as Stephanie pointed out, there was a struggle for African American artists to be included in, in New Deal programs, but um, but they they were included uh, eventually. And as you can see, I mean, the Harlan Hospital itself is, is an amazing work. But uh, that Stephanie will describe more artists that, that were involved. And um, okay, I see Stephanie's back. Let's see if she can click on. All right, let's see. Okay, let's, let's give it a try. try. I am very thankful for my technical theater background. If something's not working, you just reload it and start again. <laughs> there is no panicking. All right, give me two seconds. Harvey, did you advertise our show while, while everybody was a captive audience? You're muted. Uh, Stephanie and I are actually co-curators of an exhibit this be, uh, that will be opening this Sunday at the Berkeley Historical Society. So if, you, if you're in the Bay Area, come check it out. It's African-Americans uh, in Berkeley and this has been a three-year project. This year, we're focusing on art, entertainment, uh, literature, and sports. So it, it's kind of, as I've been calling it, all the fun stuff. Um, not that the other stuff wasn't fun, but um, this is some um, great background about some of the incredible accomplishments of, of African-Americans in Berkeley. So please all uh, come and see the exhibit at the Berkeley Historical Society is if you miss the opening, it is open from one to three uh, Thursday, uh, excuse me, one to four Thursday, Friday, and Saturdays. All right, are we back? It looks like we're very close, so just hit that swap displays button. Hold on one second. And I'll jump forward, swap displays. Yay, thank you. Yay, like I said, theater. Okay, so you're um, not seeing the notes, you're just seeing the images, correct? Correct, the slides. All right. So here we're gonna jump forward and try this again. Here we go. So you just heard information about uh, the, the Harlem Hospital murals. Um, they were covered for some 70 years and plaster, some were damaged. There were eight of them. I believe that five of them have been restored. And so the community, you know, the community came together. It cost $325 million. Um, they were discovered in 2004 during a renovation and in 2012, they started restoring them. Here's one example. 
This is Virtus Hayes. Um, on the left photograph, you'll see Morgan Smith, Virtus Hayes, Elton Surratt, 1938. His mural consisted of eight panels. Um, one of the recurrent themes of the murals of African-American artists during that time uh, was the history of African-Americans from enslavement, uh, before enslavement as Africans, during enslavement to the modern era. This particular panel highlights African-American achievements such as graduation, art creation, professional positions. Charles Alston was also one of the muralists. Uh, this diptych represents the history of healing and medicine in Africa and in the United States. Modern medicine focus focuses on the Western side. Um, you have medical instruments, you have leaders in Western medicine, such as Louis Pasteur, the French surgeon and microbiologist, and a figure representing Louis T. Wright, the first African-American doctor on the Harlem Hospital staff. And he's also someone who pioneered medical modalities for cancer uh, with his daughter. Dr. Wright was a friend of Alston's. Um, Magic and Medicine integrates the healing traditions of the South as they were brought from Africa and developed here. And they're integrated with the traditional folk medicine. Um, at the center of this composition is a female figure representing a healer. Below her are numerous smaller figures who are seeking a health and healing. Recreation in Harlem, Georgette Seabrook, 1936. It depicts daily life in Harlem. You see women talking, children playing, a couple dancing, somebody working, the mail being delivered. It's a very cheerful scene of life on the streets of Harlem during the 30s. There are 24 figures in the composition. The Harlem Community Art Center. Many minds became one. As a result, the Harlem Community Art Center is becoming not only a cultural force in its particular locale, but a symbol in the culture of a race. That's Gwendolyn Bennett. The Harlem Community Center was funded by the FPA. It opened on December 20th, 1937 with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt in attendance. It had 19 teachers and three staff members. Uh, though the faculty were predominantly black, there were also some um, Europe, people of European descent who taught there as well. This was a federal and community collaboration and the Harlem Citizens Sponsoring Committee played a role in outreach, fundraising and events. Here are the Harlem Community Art Center directors, Gwendolyn Bennett and Augusta Savage. Gwendolyn Bennett was a painter, illustrator, and arts administrator. Augusta Savage was a sculptor and arts educator. The Crisis Journal stated, there have been as many as 1,400 members registered at one time in the same year, 1939, the Art Digest announces in a headline, 1600 study art in Harlem. Augusta Savage was the first director and Gwendolyn Bennett followed her. Amongst uh, Savage's students at the Harlem Art Center were uh, Gwendolyn Knight, Jacob Lawrence, uh, Norman Lewis, William Artist, uh, Ernest Critchlow, Elton Fax, and photographers who were brothers, Morgan Smith and Marvin Smith. Among the teachers were Charles Alston, Selma Burke, uh, Henry Barnard, and James Wells. And here you see some children working. So the lessons were free. The materials were free 
And this also I did in my initial research, I found that the levels of literacy had gone up during that period of time because not only were children and adults doing art, they were reading, they were writing, they were creating. So it was a, um, a tremendous benefit. And Gwendolyn Bennett said, quote, what did the center's cumulative report show? First, and possibly the most important fact, 70,592 people by actual count had attended the center's activities during the six months it had been open. And who are these people that were reached by the center? Exactly 2,467 children and adults registered and more than 23,989 people have participated in the activities. The New Deal Connection. Over 250,000 African-American workers participated in New Deal projects. Visual artists were created, were commissioned to create pieces for the Federal Art Project, the Department of the Treasury, and the Department of Painting and Sculpture. This employment was significant during the Great Depression, a time of suffering and loss for many people in the African-American community. The, these opportunities provided through the New Deal made an enormous difference to the well-being and economic status of the people in the community. African American WPA supervisors. After the campaign by the Harlan Artists Guild, um, supervisors were hired, not only in New York, but uh, Sergeant Johnson uh, was a supervisor here in the Bay Area. Charles Alston was a painter, illustrator, and muralist. He was the first African American hired by the Federal Art Project as a supervisor. He was also a supervisor for the ha Harlem Hospital Mural Project. He also worked with Augusta Savage at the Har Harlem Artists Workshop, also known as the 306. Augusta Savage was the first director of the WPA funded Harlem Community Arts Center. She also founded the Savage School of Arts and Crafts and the Uptown Laboratory for Art, funded by the WPA in 1939. My colleagues and I know that our work is essential both for our own development and for that of the community. We think that the country as a whole may well use New Orleans as an example of what the WPA FAP can do for the cultural advancement of the Negro. When classes were organized by the WPA FAP, first in its renovated garage known as the Uptown Art Laboratory, this dream of a place that offers free classes and materials began to take shape, Gwendolyn Bennett. The program of the WPA FAP was important for with it came at long last recognition of the Negro as being capable in plastic art expression as he has long since proved to be in others of the fine arts. Aaron Douglas, a leading painter and sometimes referred to as the father of the Harlem Renaissance. In 1934, he created a four panel mural for the 135th Street branch of the New York Public Library. This branch later became known as the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. This mural was commissioned by the government's public works of art project. Here's one of the panels. This is the first one. And I want to point out that this uh, mural series is still on exhibit at the Schomburg. So here we've got several different styles going on. Um, characteristic of 
Aaron Douglas is paintings is the opacity. So you're seeing through and beyond. He uses, he often uses circles that you can see through, which provide visual motion. And then in visual analysis, you look at composition in terms of what is closest to the viewer and what is farthest. What is closest to the viewer in this particular composition are the drummers. In the midground are the dancers. And farthest from the viewer are the warriors. An idol of the Deep South. Uh, at the center is a guitarist and a banjo player. And pushed to the edges are the tools, the workers, and the despair, symbolically. And you see, as we've always talked about in the Black community, looking toward the North Star. And that vision of freedom, that vision of being uplifted. And at the center, you have, again, the circles of opacity through which you can see the dancers, through which you can see the workers. And the workers and every, every uh, part of the right side of the composition are all facing that North Star, looking toward freedom. From slavery through reconstruction, again, we have the circles, the opacity, uh, somebody holding something in their hand, a man holding something in his hand, pointing toward freedom. They say it's, some scholars say that it's pointing toward the Capitol building, but I see in that architecture, a kind of Middle Eastern or Egyptian orientation. And you see several of the workers have even stopped picking their cotton to look upward and beyond toward freedom. The Song of the Towers. Uh, this is the last of the murals. You have a saxophone player, uh, once again, integrating the multidisciplinary approach of the new, of the new Negro uh, deal, of the new Negro aspiration, which is music, which is freedom, which is dance, which is theater, and it's depicted through visual art. So in the background, you see the Statue of Liberty, and you see the saxophone player list, lifting his hand and his instrument in jubilation while the figure behind him is ascending a wheel or a cog. And we could say that symbolically that's the wheel or a cog of progress. And you see another figure in the lower left reclining. Uh, I'm still looking at this part of the painting even nine years later, and I'll probably be looking at it throughout the rest of my career because there are so many things going on here. And the towers representing the city, moving away from an agrarian way of life toward an urban way of life, moving toward freedom. And pretty amazing, just amazing. So this is Mother Goose Fairy Tales, a mural by Selma Day, who later became known as Selma Burke. It's at the Children's Medical Ward of the Harlem Hospital. So in conclusion, I've highlighted some, the words and experiences of African-American artists in this presentation. It is essential that Black voices be foregrounded in research about Black history. As noted in this presentation, the intersection between the New Deal and the Harlem Renaissance is complicated when seen through the lens of race. Nonetheless, the benefits of this federal and community collaboration outweighs the deficits. Artists were provided with funds and places where they could express the new Negro vision of identity, pride, sustenance, unity, and a connection to Africa. This partnership presents an effective model for government support of vulnerable publics, artists, and African Americans. If they've done it once, it can be replicated. Here's to a new, new deal. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie.
So just to open up with a little dialogue and, and then we'll um, have time for questions. Um, so people, please write your questions in, into the Q&A. Um, just to begin with, um, Stephanie, what, what would you say it was about Harlem, you know, this place that enabled the flowering of cultural expression represented by the Harlem Renaissance? Why did it happen in Harlem? Well, you know, in full disclosure, I'm a native New Yorker. So, you know, yeah. of course it happened in New York, the center of the universe, no? Yeah. Um, I just think the conditions were right. The conditions were right. People had moved from the South to the North. And despite the, the crowdedness of the tenants, uh, you know, there, there, was, there was energy, there was intellectual, uh, spiritual, uh, artistic energy that got generated in that particular place. And as Susan said in the beginning, it wasn't just a Harlem Renaissance, it happened across the country. So it was just a um, conflation of elements, I think, that happened to make the right recipe for this kind of a growth. But uh, I do not want to uh, not acknowledge that it was going on in other places. Well, speaking of other places, uh, you mentioned Sergeant Johnson. So John, uh, Sergeant Johnson, uh, you know, was a West Coast artist, but he's considered part of the Harlem Renaissance. Say a little bit more about Berkeley's most famous Black artist of that period. Um, well, not only is he Berkeley's most famous artist, and not only do we share a last name, but if I look across the park from my house, that's where his studio was. And and, you know, Harvey, you and I are trying to get a plaque put there to acknowledge him. Um, you know, he, Sergeant Johnson's output of art, you know, primarily my research has been in public art, uh, not the artists that showed in galleries and so on and so on, but the public artists. But uh, Sergeant Johnson was one of the favorites of the Harmon Foundation that had quite a number of ex exhibitions for black artists. And so he was known and you know, when he did his WPA work here in the Bay Area, he was known. And I think that, I think that the way he did his work and his looking toward Africa, he also went to Mexico and studied. I think that he was kind of discovered and he was such an open person in terms of being able to, to travel. Um, why he was chosen out of other people, I don't know. Uh, I'm not quite certain why other than the fact that he was known because he exhibited so much with the Harmon Foundation that, you know, once you're a public figure, then you're known. So I'm sure there's more to be researched exactly about that connection, but uh, those are my thoughts at the moment. Okay. Um, the the uh, Black Lives Matter movement represents, I think a, another pivot, you know, in American uh, African-American history, you know, like the Harlem Renaissance. And um, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about it and in reference, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, but but particularly about the, the visual arts since you focused on that. Sure. Um, you know, I think that the visual arts have played a really important part. And I actually do a lecture for my students about the visual parts, the visual components of the Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movements, um, both of which are generated from Black uh, folks and primarily Black women. Um, you know, there's a connection. They're building upon what happened in the Black Arts Movement, which built upon what happened in the Harlem Renaissance Movement. They have many more technical tools, technological tools, in terms of generating um, agency collaborating with people. They have a lot more, it, more can be known, more can be done in this era then. And what I'm liking that I see happening is they also hearken back to previous eras. Um, unlike the individualistic kind of paradigm that we have going on in this country, they look back, they look left, they look right, they look around and they really are a collaborative team. It seems as though they're decentralized and I'm really enjoying the way they use the visual arts in all of their materials. 
in posters, in flyers, in street art, you know, painting on streets that can be seen from an aerial view. I mean, it, it's just, it's incredible. And just as my mother was so happy to be alive in the 60s, so I'm happy to be alive now in the 2020s to be able to see this flowering, this regeneration, and this pushback against negativity, against racism, against hypermasculinity, all those things. Um, I'm, I'm very privileged to have been able to see the 60s and now to be in the 2020s. Very okay. generative periods. Well, maybe we should get to uh, some of the questions that uh, people have um, given us. And one, I, I guess we, we didn't deal with the basics because one question is what is WPA FAP? And essentially we're talking about the Works Progress Administration mm -hmm. of the New Deal, which started in 1935 and went into the early forties. And then the Federal Art Project, which was part of that. Um, the, the, the WPA wasn't the only New Deal art program. There, there were also others, but uh, that's the one that we've been uh, pretty much focusing on today. Yeah, WPA, FAP, yes. And the Department of the Treasury, which in my initial research, I discovered you know some very interesting things about that and their commissions. We got a question. Uh, do we know if the WPA art centers around the US allowed blacks to participate, including in the South? There was, to the best, my, my initial research was on New York. Um, what I found out in, in wandering from that area is that indeed there were uh, African Americans that participated in uh, New Deal projects. Um, there were also African Americans that were brought into New Deal projects by allies in the South. It was not a safe time to do that. And so I want to do a shout out to Alliance and how important that is. Um, they were not paid properly in the South at all. And there was not the same kind of organizing advocacy system that you had in the North. Um, so I think that it's very complicated, but you saw the brother from New Orleans was praising WPA. So I'm, I'm sure I could find more materials on individuals who were, you know, who had that opportunity and were able to brave that. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, you mentioned that the WPA funded the Harlem Community Arts Center, Savage School of Arts and Crafts, and the Uptown Art Laboratory. With so much resistance to hiring African American super supervisors, was it an uphill battle to get the funding for these three organizations in particular? I, I'd like to say, and I'd like to think, and I'm going to get some research to back it up, that Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, I think the Black Cabinet, as they referred to themselves, the Black Cabinet of FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt were probably instrumental behind the scenes in making these things happen. But it was not just them doing that, but I think that the organizing of the community to demand that they got resources um, was the other. So there were two levers op operating at the same time. So you have uh, Eleanor in the background pushing, pushing, and then you have the community pushing. And it was a period of time in which that could happen. Not, not everywhere, and not to the extent probably that it should have, but it did happen. Um, another question, is there any connection between the institutions you've discussed and the Harlem School of the Arts founded in 1964? That I don't know. That I do not know. I mean, there's always something, there, there, there are a lot of, from the ground up, grassroots, organizations that happened in Harlem. And I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not gonna tell you something I don't know about. But you know, that's a very active and generative black community and always has been forever. You can still you can also find those communities in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx where I'm from. Um, <clears throat> there have always been communities of black folks coming together 
to share resources and demand that resources come from governmental and institutional uh, places as well. Um, there's a question about the art centers and, and kind of what happened to them. And there were a hundred of them established by the WPA. Um, only a handful of them um, still continue. We actually have one here in the Bay Area in Richmond, California, that was established as a WPA art center and still is a very vibrant uh, organization that uh, teaches art and uh, exhibits art. So um, the fact that th that happened and we still have a few existing, I think kind of points to what Stephanie was saying earlier that, yeah, we, we, we know how to do this. We could do it again. Um, I would argue to argue that we must do it again. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, another question about interactions between other parts of the WPA and the visual artist, uh, the, this person that question says, uh, her grandfather, for example, was in the Writers Project in Chicago. Uh, one major part of the uh, uh, Writers Project were the guidebooks for uh, every state in, in the country at that time and in many cities. And, and there was a collaboration of photography, artwork, um, drawings in, in all those volumes. Uh, and then there were there were other other crossovers also. So it wasn't as if these projects, the writing and the art, was separate. Um, it, you know, the theater project, and you know, was also that sets needed to be designed. So you you had artistic elements uh, in in that also. And plays needed to be written. I mean, a yes. theater theater by its very nature, and that's my primary art form, uh, is interdisciplinary. You have somebody writing, somebody directing, somebody doing the visuals. Um, and that's one of the things I love about it. And I'm just fixing my light here because the sun's going down. Okay. Um, there's a question about, is there a, a guide or map of WPA public art by African-Americans uh, in California? Um, I don't know of one, but of course the Living New Deal, the, the core of our project is the uh, the map, the digital map, and we've also published a, a, um, a map of, of, of cities, San Francisco uh, and, and New York uh, and Washington, D.C., and we're thinking about working on Los Angeles. Um, and um, among co contemporary Black, art, Black muralists working today, who are you following? Oh my goodness. There, there are just so many that, you know, if I start naming them and leave somebody out, then I feel bad. But suffice it to say that I've done enormous research on uh, Black muralists from the 60s till now. And, you know, each one of them offers a different perspective. And what's important about mural art is that it has the possibility of carrying with it history so that things are not forgotten so that things are and with murals they're in public view 24 7 and that's why I'm, i mostly do my research on public art because it's accessible to everyone you don't have to have money you don't have to have certain kind of formal education a public art is accessible to everybody 24 7 so um, I don't want to name any names and get in trouble, but suffice it to say, I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at them and following all of them as best I can. Okay, well, I'll, uh, maybe I'll get in trouble. Um, I, I'll just mention that just because um, I just saw it recently. Emery Douglas, the the great artist of the Black Panther Party, has a, a mural up right now and, and an exhibit with it at the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And then I would also want to mention, give a shout out to Dewey uh, Crumpler, who um, was involved uh, in doing a mural at George Washington High School that was a response mural to the mural done by Victor Arnertoff under, under the New Deal. And uh, that Dewey, was a huge controversy. You should yeah. tell what that controversy was about. Yeah, and and Dewey was quite out, outspoken in, in saying because the, the, there there were some school board members that wanted to destroy the Arnertoff mural. And Dewey said quite clearly that um, um, my mural needs the Arnertoff 
mural and the Arnotoff mural needs my mural. Um, so check out Dewey Crumpler um, or Emory Douglas if you're not familiar with them. Um, I think Brother Dewey, Brother Dewey is, is amazing. I have not seen him in years, but uh, he was very helpful to me when I first started my uh, visual art career here in the Bay Area. He's, he's an amazing brother. Yeah, definitely. Um, no Arnatov. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. I don't know if we have time for another one here. Um, okay. Uh, well, I think that might, you know, we're pretty much to the, yeah, we've got about four minutes. So any, any last thoughts, uh, Stephanie, anything you want to add? Um, I don't know, you know, I, I've been described as um, a relentless optimist. And I guess that's what keeps me out of prison. You know, so I, um, I, I believe that we can create a new New Deal. I believe in the assets and the advocacy that can be, be provided by government. I am not anti-government. I think government can do better than it does, clearly. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I just am very uplifted by young people these days. And, you know, they're fighting for climate. They're fighting for the earth. They're fighting for one another. I feel very energized by them, just the way my parents were energized by me and my misbehaviors in the 60s and 70s. So I, I don't want us, I want us to organize. I want us to organize, be upful, be joyful, and change this machine. Thank you so much, both of you, for this interesting conversation. I, there's someone who's joined our uh, our call, Greta Berman, who has a special connection to the Harlem Hospital murals. I wonder if if she would like to talk about that. Can she can she join in, Brid Bridget? Um, I I'd have to invite her as a panelist. It's not exactly like it's not too hard. It's a call. It's a little okay. tricky. Maybe you but... maybe you could read her comments from the chat. Yeah, she loud, said that she discovered the Harlem hospital murals in 1973 and published a book about them in 1975. What's and the she, name of the book? Uh, she didn't write that here. I, well, you can Google her. You can find stuff online. So I think uh, um, it's that is easily done, so. But anyway, she says that she, in, she interviewed Alston at length and uh, she has some interpretation of Aaron Douglas's works at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll have to bring her back. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much, Stephanie, for this for this time and and for all you shared with us tonight. And and Harvey, thank you again. Um, and thank everyone for for joining us tonight. I hope that you all enjoyed it, and we hope to see you again soon at, at our future webinars. The next one is May nineteenth with um, Annie Rothstein Sagan. Please support the Living New Deal if you can. Have a good night. Night, everybody. Good night.